Hi, this is Peter Hamilton, and earlier this month I moderated a panel on live programming, particularly live wildlife programming at Wildscreen Conference in Bristol. And on the panel was Graham Wallington, who's joining my call today from Joburg. So welcome, Graham. Oh, thank you very much, Peter. It's great to be on the call. Graham, let's start by telling us about your, your background, how you came to be a specialist in live wildlife programming. So I, um, I actually entered this industry from the Internet side, um, and uh, we started um, streaming live back in 1998. Well, actually, the streaming only began in early 2000. Um, and then we did a television show um, for UK TV Horizons um, in 2001 where we did 27 live television episodes. And I, I was executive producer on that, and it absolutely blew me away. And uh, ever since then, I've just been looking for more and more different ways to really take live wildlife and have it live both digitally as well as on television. And so now your core programming, your, your, you know, your business, your franchise, is built around Safari Live, which is a Nat Geo Wild uh, program. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Safari Live? Absolutely, yes. We, um, we license um, quite a number of shows to um, Nat Geo Wild um, each year from, from our team and location at Safari Live, which is uh, in the Great Kruger National Park within the Sabi Sands Game Reserve in South Africa, where we have uh, a crew of um, 20 20 odd people, 25 people, that produce two live, expert hosted, interactive, high definition safaris every single day. Three hours in the morning from dawn, and then another three hours in the afternoon until sunset. Um, and it's an opportunity for viewers um, to, to follow the unfolding lives of all the various different animal characters that we encounter, leopards and lion prides and, and elephant herds, um, and get to know them as individuals through the eyes of our expert guides, and also to get, these, these, um, get their questions answered in real time. We also do what we call school sessions, which is where we, um, at no charge, we, we bring school children from all over the world along on our safaris. And while, while the kids are watching, those are the only questions that we answer um, is the ones from those particular groups of kids. And we're really proud of that project as well. Who actually are the hosts or guides? Okay, so what we have is a team of, um, of six um, professional safari guides, qualified professional experienced safari guides, who, um, who, who each day take out, um, we send out two vehicles for each safari, uh, two safari vehicles as well as a bushwalk and sometimes a drone um, and sometimes a little rover as well. Um, and then we have a tent set where another guide uh, hosts the show from within that tent set. And basically... These, um, these people would normally be driving guests around, but now that they work full-time for Safari Live, they're driving you know, virtual guests um, and, a camera t and a camera operator um, around on, on Safari. And then we have another team um, in our final control, also in, in the Kruger Park, where we cut between these various different vehicles um, and the bushwalk and, and the rover and, and so on um, and, and kind of pick out the best moments, the best sightings throughout that three-hour three hour show. So, so cl natural history, uh, the genre has you know, classically relied on, on you know, really hard-to-get sequences you know, that require a cinematographer to sit on top of a tree for three weeks or more to wait for this spectacular sequence. It seems to me like you run the risk of your programs, of your content going in the opposite direction where the lions are snoozing for the time that you feed them live and it's very hard and it must be a challenge to you know, create uh, you know, these, these high moments that audiences seem to depend uh, in the genre. So absolutely, that, that has always been, um, you know, the, the, the sort of the first comment that people do make thought that wildlife was, you know, was, was so difficult to predict and you needed an awful lot of patience to get those high energy moments. And, you know, to some extent that's very true. Um, and, and of course, you know, this is completely live and the animals, you know, don't have agents and they don't follow instructions at all well. Um, and so, so that is definitely a risk. And we, and we mitigate against that in, in, in a variety of different ways. First of all, the location that we selected um, in, in the Sabi Sands um, Game Reserve is a, 
is a particularly high density of habituated animals, which means that the probability of us encountering lions and leopards and elephants and so on is very high right off the bat. Number two is that um, this is an area with a high density of very high-end uh, commercial safari operators, which means that there are quite a number of other vehicles out at the same time that we are, all connected via radio. And this gives us a real advantage because it allows us to have effectively many, many, many tracking vehicles out there all sharing these what we call sightings. Another factor is that, um, is that we, we time our television shows um, you know, very carefully. Um, and depending on where we are in the seasons, we see a, 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 a different behavior from animals. For example, at the moment, we're experiencing very, very high heat, which means that the, more, the period just after dawn in the morning is when you're most likely to see you know, lions hunting and, and, and that sort of content. So scheduling is, is crucial. And then more recently, a massive change has taken place in our world, and that is the advent of Facebook Live, which now means that we can break free from those television schedules and rather now work to, to nature's schedule. And so when something's happening, that's when we go live, and it shows up in, in our Facebook um, viewers' news feeds. Well, let's come back to Facebook because that's a really you know, fascinating new hot development that actually you know, puts you and your work, I think, at the center of a major trend in, um, in programming right now. But let's come back to scheduling for the 24 by 7 network. Now, Dan Salerno, uh, who is an executive and a good friend of ours uh, at NetGeo Wild, he was on the panel and he can't speak for himself here. But what's in it for um, Nat Geo Wild, and, and, and what are the scheduling challenges that they must face? First of all, the key, the key thing, if Dan was on this call, and, and what he said on the panel I think is very important, is that this, the, the relationship between Wild Earth and, and National Geographic Wild and, and around Safari Live is not something that just happened. We've been, we've been developing this product and relationship together for, for some couple of years now, two, two, three, coming up on three years. And we've really gone through a series of steps um, and, and slowly ramped up the, 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 the level of the content. We moved from a daytime show into a primetime television show. Uh, we continue to do the daily broadcast, which has really helped us to fine-tune this product in, in, a, in a very careful and, and considered way. Um, and, and I think that you know, what's in it for Nat Geo Wild, uh, other than having a great you know, primetime television show that connects their viewers directly to nature in a very sort of brand friendly way, um, and, and it is the fact that there's a huge super fan base that have developed around Safari Live, um, and, that, and that this continuous relationship that exists between Nat Geo Wild's audience and, and Safari Live, even outside of the television programming, I think is a big part of it. We, we, do, we do two to three um, Facebook Live um, broadcasts each day um, on Facebook reaching you know, their almost combined, I think just on 50 million followers. Um, and, and, and this daily connection is something that you know, the, the viewers are really seeking. It's they, they want to be connected to nature. They want to be connected to those animal characters, not just you know, once a week on a TV show. So I think, I think that in summary, I think that the key opportunity here for Nat Geo Wild is this continuous connection with their audience, not just in the TV shows. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, what do we know about the level of overlap between the two audiences, uh, the, the, the television, uh, the, the, the viewing on Nat Geo Wild and the Facebook audience? Are they distinct or is there a lot of overlap? Um, I'm not sure, actually, to be honest. Uh, you know, I don't really have that kind of data to, to give a, a, a really accurate opinion based on any kind of hard data. And anecdotally, I can tell you that our superfan base uh, would almost certainly, you know, without fail, watch the television shows uh, if, if they can. So if they receive Nat Geo Wild in, in their home, they will watch it when it comes out. So I, I say the overlap is... 100% super fans that can physically get onto watching it on TV will watch it. Um, but, but that's just an opinion, really, and a gut feel rather than anything based on any hard data. Yeah, also anecdotally, Graham, I've seen some Facebook posts 
uh, where the uh, Facebook friends say, hey, I never heard about WOW, this is fantastic. And um, so that, that was indicating that there was a separate audience. And secondly, the, but the demos are so much younger for Facebook Live than for traditional viewing. So uh, you've got to believe that um, Nat Geo Wild uh, are thrilled to be able to, to contact such a vast, potentially vast or young, youth, relatively youthful audience uh, on Facebook. Absolutely. And we're seeing that audience growing in, in all demographics. I mean, that, that I can speak to, and, and I can say that a vast audience um, coming out of Facebook. Uh, it's not really surprising when you consider the number of monthly active users that Facebook has, and you know that that, that, that this Facebook Live is pretty young and it's pretty it's pretty dynamic in the way it shows up in the news feed. Um, it, it's not. That's surprising, but I can assure you that it, we're staggered actually at the, at the growth of audiences on, on this new platform. So let's uh, move just quickly beyond your regular Safari live feed. Uh, you also create uh, big event specials uh, around you know, momentous happenings uh, in the wildlife uh, calendar in Africa. So tell us about those initiatives. Although the vast majority of our broadcasts come from uh, from the Kruger Park at this point, which is where our team you know is is, is accommodated and and we've got all our vehicles and so on, but over the past few months um, we started doing more and more short mobile trips uh, in various parts of Africa um, and incorporating this back into the Safari Life story. Most recently, we spent some time in the in the in Kenya's Mara Triangle. Um, watching the, the migration there and spending a lot of time with lion prides hunting at night and watching crossings across the Mara River by the wildebeest and zebra and, and, and Thompson's gazelle herds. And that was amazing. And I think that, again, without laboring on about Facebook, but what, what was particularly interesting about that is that we were able to wait until those herds began to cross the river and then immediately go live at that right moment which meant that there was no wastage. There was, you know, the audience got exactly what they wanted. They, they, they got the opportunity to see the action only. And then James Henry, one of our hosts, you know, was, was really commentating in almost like a sport-type style over the action, um, which is also a bit different. It's, instead of that normal sort of narration that one would expect from a natural history program, this, was, um, this was felt much more like a sporting event and really a very much more exciting commentary you know, as, as the crocodiles were coming in and, 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 and smashing the, the various animals. So I think that, that, that we're, we're seeing a, a trend in this direction. We're planning on a lot more of these type of, um, of, of trips to various different spectacles throughout Africa and, and, and further afield. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think it's an exciting sort of development within Safari Live and Wild Earth in general. We have a clip on our website uh, that you provided that was prepared for a wild screen in Bristol and it uh, captures those unbelievably dramatic events um, that you just described. So, you know, I'm convinced that Live is a increasingly important you know, it's more than a niche. It's a, a sector of the entire uh, broadcasting uh, industry uh, because it provides immediacy and it allows for the networks to be able to compete with this behemoth uh, Facebook, uh, particularly Facebook video, which is just rising like a, a giant rocket ship. But from your point of view, what are the three big takeaways that you've learned uh, from developing and operating uh, Safari Live? So I, I, I would say that definitely, you know, the first one has to be that authenticity is what audiences want. Um, the, the, I think there's a real demand for real. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think that Live, you know, in, in, at its very core, you know, is, yes, it provides immediacy, it provides telepresence, some kind of a connection, which I think viewers definitely seek. But there's something about the truth and that real feeling that they're seeing the real world that, that seems to be super valuable. I think a second takeaway from 2016 unquestionably has to be Facebook Live has changed the game. And, and it, you know, in several ways, but I think the key one is this concept of being able to broadcast only when there's something to broadcast changes everything. The viewers wait in the news feed, 
and get it when it's really happening. And I think that you know we'll always look back on on this as a, a watershed moment here. And then the third big thing is something which you know we've we've really kind of learnt and relearned over and over, and that is it's all about practice. It's all about rehearsal, and and it's all about having those long-term partnerships like the ones we have with Nat Geo Wild, where we can keep developing every single day, six hours of live TV a day, and it allows you to work out all the problems, get focused on the content, get focused on the narrative, and not be sweating all the technical issues you know, when you actually come to deliver that primetime TV show. So it's authenticity, Facebook Live, nature schedule, and, and, and it's all about the practice. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, Graham, let's wrap up now. Uh, before we do, we both want to thank um, Wildscreen for inviting us to the panel at, um, in Bristol. Uh, Inga Samuels was our producer. Thank you so much, Inga. And Dan Salerno, of course, from Nat Geo Wild. And um, James Honeybourne uh, also presented a Big Blue Live from the BBC and PBS. So thanks to them. And uh, Graham, I'm just going to exhort everybody to watch the clip, uh, which is on documentarytelevision.com. And uh, thank you. We'll look forward to our next conversation because we know that this is a, a, a hot area and you're definitely one of the leaders in the genre. Thank you very, very much, Peter. Really appreciate it. Um, and again, thank you also to Wild Screen and to James and to Dan. And it was uh, an honor and a privilege to be a part of it. Thank you. See ya.